What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan from Lathrop High School in California and morganapteaching.com. I've got here another free AP lecture for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know to help you do your best on the AP test. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you find this video helpful. All right, so now we're starting period five. And what, is, what era is that called? Modern. 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 Modern era, right. And the big starter here is that big event we just talked about, the Industrial Revolution. Although we're gonna start with economics first and then get into the Industrial Revolution. I want you guys to keep in the back of your brains, though, the scientific revolution, because that's what almost directly leads to the Industrial Revolution. This emphasis on innovation, freedom of thought, and these new technologies are going to really lead to mechanization and the Industrial Revolution. However, before we get there, we are going to have... Um, well, how, do I, how do I start this off? I start this off economically. So period five years. So it's a modern era. And again, that's going to be... 1750, oh, I was going to have you begin here. 1750 to what? 900. To 900, right, it goes back. <laughs> I'll put C, but we all know what it is. All right, cool. So that's the era we start with. So we're going to start with, with economic systems here. That's what we're going to start with. So, we'll start with, how do I phrase this? Oh, economic system, innovation. So let's first establish what we had as far as economic systems go in the, uh, in the early modern era. What were my dominant economic systems? Mercantilism. Mercantilism. That is correct. <clears throat> and refresh my memory. What was this again? Fixed wealth systems. Yeah. What's going to replace it here? Capitalism. Capitalism. Now, it doesn't get the name until what's well already rolling, but it does get that name later uh, through you know, Adam Smith and his book, Wealth of Nations, and it's really codified and they start identifying it. But it exists before that. We're going to talk about how it comes to be in existence. So, replaced by capitalism. All right, and this, this is my modern and contemporary economic system that's going to be the most popular. I cannot find a marker that is not dying. I hit the rim and then popped out. I have one. Oh, it's cool. I have some, but thank you. I got, I'll just go through, and everyone that's not perfect, I'm just going to talk. So, mercantilism, replaced by capital. So, what we want to go through here is that whole, you guys struggled with this last time, but you got it by the end of it, the whole development that, that took basically exploration and turned Europe into this like commercialized money house, essentially. So, we have, of course, exploration in the 16th and 17th centuries. And what's going to happen here is things like gold, silver, and cash crops are going to cause what to raise substantially in the in the in, in Europe. Money supply. Money supply, right. And just those, in case you forgot or you're on the internet, you don't know. The money supply is really just how much actual money they have, like gold, silver, coins, etc. Uh, how much money is going to be over here. So when they get all these goods, they sell them, of course, to... So here's the goods coming over. Here's the gold and the silver and cash crops. Cash crops being tobacco, sugar, coffee, cacao, and other things. Gold, silver, cash crops. So when that gets here, Europeans get it, especially the Western Europeans, because well, they have it. And they sell it. To other Europeans, and who else do they sell it to? to Asia. Yeah, Africa and Asia. So they sell it to all these locations, essentially. So what happens with all the money in the world? Where's it all going for the most part? Europe. It's going to Europe, right? So they get incredibly wealthy. They get a large amount of money very quickly. So their money supply is going to increase. So if you guys are all Europeans, and I'm a European, and you all have money, and I'm selling you something, if I know you all have a lot of money, what am I going to do to the price of my goods? Raise You're going to raise them, right. So this is good. And what do we call it when all the prices start raising it very quickly? Price revolution, right. Increases. 
European money supply. This, of course, is going to lead to a rise in prices in Europe, aka the price revolution. So all the prices have increased. Wow, it now becomes very profitable to sell things. So what is something that, if I have extra money, people are gonna be buying first, they very much need? Food. Food, that's one of the first commodities to really raise up in price because you guys, it's really hard to take, or it's really easy to take it for granted back then. Like, food was not just like a thing anybody came across. It was, it was hard to get, like people to work for that. So, well, they still have to work for it, but it was a lot, people died from famine back then. We don't have that here in the West. We don't know what that's like anymore, to die from famine. They did back then, though. So, one of the first things people would spend this extra money on, of course, is food before they bought luxury items. So, you have a massive increase in sale and price of food. So now, it becomes very profitable to do what? Sell food. Sell food. Wait a second, sell food? Nobody sells food. What do they do with food back then? Uh, yeah, they do sustenance farming. They give the rest to? Lord. Lord, right? That's like that whole common land corvée labor system. So, what can I do with, instead with that extra food I'm getting? Commercialize. I can commercialize and sell it. In fact, that becomes the most profitable thing I can do as a landowner. So, it becomes profitable to sell excess food for profit. And of course, anytime I'm selling something for profit, that is called what? Commercialization. Commercialization, right. Well, snap. Now I'm a noble, or I'm a merchant, or a banker, or somebody who's getting rich off of this scheme. I'm gonna to wanna to buy some land, because it's extremely profitable. But there's a problem. Who owns the land? The lords. The lords, right? What's that called again? Peasants live on? Common. Common land, right. So I'm going to have to buy the land, and can I just have peasants running around doing whatever they want on that land, trampling it, having their animals go over, hunting, not farming correctly? No. No, I want, I want to farm that efficiently. I want to keep as few people on it as possible, just enough to run it. I don't want the animals trampling and eating my crops. I want to use all that territory for growing agriculture. So what am I going to have to do to make money with these peasants on this common land. Yeah. You have to kick them off because that's called the enclosure. So when landowners, including nobles, or people that just bought land, got the peasants that were on it, they started kicking the peasants off and ending this whole common land thing, ending the whole common land law protection. Um, so that's what ends up happening. So to profit, people, or I should say landowners, land owners closed. Oh, land, the enclosure movement. So they close off land, that's the enclosure movement. And they start making it for, for profit. Right, and of course this is the end of common land. In fact, this is a new idea. This is the first time in European history somebody owns a piece of land. It's just theirs, not the kings, not the lords, etc. What do you call that when you own that property? Private, Private property. Private property, right. And what countries are... Hmm. <coughs> yeah, England and the Netherlands, you guys know the answer that's coming up. But what I want to get is how you get there. Because this is a lot of like stages here. It's very complex. So, this is the end of common land, right? And I have the emergence of private property. So, what are these landowners going to want to start protecting from the government so they don't just take it from them? They need property rights. Yeah, they need property rights. Exactly. And I'm going to start getting those in the Netherlands and England first. All right. So, we have states focus on protection of property or property rights in England and the Netherlands. Now, my question to you is going to be, why England and the Netherlands and not France or the Holy Roman Empire or wherever else? They were Protestant. 
That means they could take. Uh, That's true. They are Protestant, but they still have they still have common land laws in those areas. Why are they getting rid of them there? Uh, they have um, normal people in the government. You're right. They have this new class of people, new wealthy landowner banker, these new gentry class. They're in the government. How are they? This is the only place that really has this. Why are they in the government? Because they have an equal amount of, um, like in the representative assemblies, they have the gentry class. And that it may make their own laws. They would, yeah, exactly. So in their government, they have a parliamentary government, a representative assembly. And in that parliament, they have regular people, regular gentry, bankers, you know, merchants, landowners, etc. They've all they all own private property and they're a part of the government. They help make the laws. So what kind of laws are they gonna make? Ones that protect their ones that protect their stuff, their private property, exactly. And where where do I have these gentry class regular people in uh, in England? Where they what, what part of Parliament are they in? House of Commons. House of Commons, exactly. So <coughs> England and the Netherlands start because they have gentry, and again, in case you forgot the definition, those are just rich, regular people, non-nobles. So it could be landowners, bankers, merchants, whatever. In the government, and in England, for example, you have the House of Commons in the Parliament. English Parliament. It's two houses. And it these guys make laws, including tax, property laws, tax laws, etc. You have the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Who's in the House of Lords? Um, all the nobles. And nobles, the exactly. And also some of the clergy, too. Some of the Anglican church people. And who's in my House of Commons? Gentry. That's the gentry's at, exactly. And later on in period five, we're going to start getting working class people there, but, but not yet. Not quite yet. Okay, one last thing to add to this. This super long list of things, which you guys, by the way, have been nailing this whole time. Um, I don't know where I was going with this. Oh, so in closure movement, all these peasants are moving off of the land. Where are they going? Cities. 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 Is that called the cities? And why is that important going forward here in period five? Because we need a workforce for the industrial revolution. Exactly. So when factories start popping up, do I have a labor force for them? Yes. yes. yes I've got a bunch of unemployed, unhappy <coughs> peasants that are going to uh, fill those factory jobs. All right. So I have peasants move, or many of them do, to cities. And that's called urbanization. And that provides a workforce for the factories that are coming. Factories are coming. All right. Wasn't the ending of common land like an actual law? It was. In fact, we had a rebellion in the uh, in in opposition to this. Does anybody remember what it was? Yeah, it was Kett's Rebellion, exactly. The peasants got so upset they got kicked off of common land, they'd been on for generations. They actually rebelled, they got stopped. But um, we actually had Kett's Rebellion in England in opposition to this. Did they only end common land in England and Netherlands? That's where they initially ended. And then it starts spreading to the rest of Europe later. All right, any questions about this process? It's a long one, it's a complex one. Most teachers just avoid the hell out of it. It's actually a little more Eurocentric than AP World, but I mean, it's hard to just jump into capitalism without understanding how you get there. Because again, capitalism's existed for a couple hundred years before Adam Smith like writes the book on, on what codifies it. Was England, England and the Netherlands the only governments at the time that had regular people? Not the only, but they're the first ones to have like a powerful enough, rich enough gentry class in there to get these changes, if that makes sense. All right, so we good on this? Yeah. So Sweet. all of this leads to capitalism? Yeah, we'll get to that part next. Uh, this is just setting the stage here for commercialization. All right, because this is how they start getting their ideas. Because this is how people get rich initially, is that landowners, and they start figuring out, oh, factories are the way to go. <coughs> all right. So, 1776, Adam Smith writes a book called Wealth of Nations. Yep, Wealth of Nations. 
that's the shorthand of that works. Now, capitalism had been going for quite a while. Like, we've, we've already had risk-taking business owners buying things, including land, ships, paying for exploration, selling goods, kicking peasants off land, commercializing that land, commercializing agriculture, manufacturing goods, etc. That's been going on for a while. However, Adam Smith writes a book that details how they can make the system run the most efficiently possible, as, as efficiently as possible, right? So we already have these elements, like, we already have commercialization. We also have stable banks in Europe for investment. And we have lots of landowners in Europe by the 18th century. So he starts theorizing some ways that they could make it better or explaining why it works so well in places like England and the Netherlands. So one of the things he comes up with is allowing people to be innovative is really important. Allowing them to be risk takers, be innovative, and invent things. And what is what is a leftover part of medieval Europe and and mercantilism that is keeping people from being innovative in their techniques yeah, and, and guilds. whatnot? Guilds. Yeah, guilds, exactly. Right. So he is going to say we need to get rid of guilds because they, of course, um, inhibit innovation. And again, they do that by, if you're going to try to come up with a new way of making something, you can't do it in a guild, because they give you a specific way to make something. If I want to do something, I want to do a certain job, I might even get that job, because who picks who gets that job? The guilds, right? They check the quality, they determine the price, all that stuff. So, you need to get rid of guilds to have any sort of actual freedom of thought or innovation. So they do that. And in fact, there's another part of mercantilism that he believes is wrong. He doesn't believe there's a certain amount of money in the world. What's that called again? Fixed wealth. Fixed wealth. What does is, what is Adam Smith believe in it and has noted has been going on? Creation. Wealth creation, right. This is going to advocate a wealth creation cycle. Based on um, high employment and low cost of production. Why do we want a low cost of production? What's the point of that? So prices are low. What happens if prices are lower? Or people buy more stuff. And then what happens when people buy stuff? They need more employees. Yep, they need more to make, to make more. So they hire more employees. So then more people have money. What do they do with that money? They buy, more. they buy more, right? That's what that wealth creation cycle is, right? So it's the low prices equal people buy more. <coughs> Then they have to make more, and they hire more people, then they have more money, and they buy more, and they have to make more, and they, they hire more people, and they have to make money. That's that wealth creation cycle. We don't want to go any other way around like it did in the Panic of 1873 or in the Great Depression, but uh, that's, that's essentially the wealth creation cycle. So if I need low cost of production, what's one thing I'm really going to need to have that's have eliminated that's keeping prices higher than I want them to be? Tariffs. Tariffs, absolutely. So we also call it removal of... Um, calls for tariffs to be removed to keep prices low. All right. And then, um, so I want tariffs and guilds gone. <coughs> like, that's a big part of it here. So I'm going to put that kind of up here. Guilds, tariffs, gone. Um, what's it called when I have no tariffs and countries are just trading with each other with no extra cost? Free trade. Free trade, yeah. Laissez faire is the government's not involved, and that's true. That's what this is. But the whole target here is to, the, is they want free trade. No tariffs or price additions on there. Okay. Still want free trade. All right. But my goodness, guys. Who's going to choose what to make, how much to make, what price, um, and, and what's going to happen if anyone can buy my stuff like in different countries? Aren't, aren't I going to go out of business? Mm -hmm. If I can, if Britain's stuff is cheaper and I'm a French like lumberjack, oh. aren't I going to run out of business? Aren't I going to go out of business? Yeah. I might, yeah, but what am I supposed to do? 
yeah, you, you produce what you can make the most efficiently, right? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, let's let's stick with this this guilds thing. So here's the, the core of this wealth creation system. So I got to get rid of guilds and tariffs. So hmm, I already got them up here, but I'll write them again right here. So number one, no guilds slash tariffs. Well, if these guilds and tariffs aren't determining what my prices are going to be, who's supposed to determine the price? The market, the market does, right. Um, if I'm selling something for too much money, like if I'm selling this pen for $30, am I going to sell it? No. no, I'm not, right? So how am I going to know what to sell it for? Um, if, people are buying it. if people are buying it or not, exactly. So if, if I'm selling this for $0.10 cents and I can't make enough of these things to actually either make money myself or I can't even supply enough to you guys that are buying them, what should I do with my price? Lower it. Raise, Raise it. it. Why would I lower it? <laughs> oh, I'm already selling them faster than I can make them and I'm not making enough money off them. Right, so I've raised the price so I've got about equilibrium where I'm making a profit and I'm making a certain amount and you're, you're buying about that same amount, essentially, okay? So that's going to be a very core fundamental price here is market-driven prices and products for the most, for the most part. Now, I'll leave the products out for now. So market-driven prices, and again, that means I know the price I should use because that is the price you are buying my stuff at that I can make enough money off of. Again, if I'm selling for too cheap, I'm not making enough money, or I'm selling it faster than I can even make it. I've got to raise the price. If I'm, if I'm selling them for too much and you aren't buying them, I need to lower my price. So you guys, the demand, the consumers, basically tell me what the price is supposed to be by what you're buying or not buying. Okay. So do I need, do I need guilds to do this then? No. No, I don't. All right, guilds also monitor quality, like if I'm making a good pen or not. How do I know if I'm making a good pen or not? Whether people buy it or not. Okay, people are buying it, but what if I'm the only person? You're going to buy my pen regardless. Competition. Competition, right. So if somebody else starts selling pens and, and we're selling for the same price, but their pen lasts, lasts longer, which one are you going to buy? Oh, you're going to buy there. So what am I to do to my pen? Make, Make the quality higher or, or even lower the price maybe. But exactly, that's my quality checker is going to be competition. So competition ensures... Lower price and higher quality. And again, it's a very simple example. If somebody else is selling pens and theirs is cheaper and they're about the same quality, you're going to buy theirs. So I'm going to drop my price. If we're selling them at the same price and my quality is worse, you're going to buy theirs. So I'm going to raise my quality. That's what dictates the price and the quality. It's the market and then, of course, this interaction with competition. Because again, if I'm by myself and you guys need pens, what can I do? Raise. Raise the price or I can make a crappy pen. But if I have competition, I better make a good good pen at a nice low price or I'm not going to be able to sell any of them, essentially. Okay, so we've got those fundamentals down. But wait, there's one more thing. How do I know that all the things that need to be made for society, this is what guilds handle, are going to be made, like medicine, for example. How do I know I'm going to have enough medicine if guilds or the government aren't telling me to make it? The invisible hand, people. The invisible hand, you're right. How does the invisible hand work? How, how does the invisible hand ensure I have everything I need for society without anybody telling me what to make? It doesn't do greed. Greed provides need. Companies will make stuff that the people need, which... Uh, since a lot of people will buy it, they'll make it. Exactly. So if everybody needed medicine for smallpox, would that be a profitable business venture for me? Yeah. It would, right? Because you all need it because you don't want to die and suffer. So somebody's going to be willing to make a small product, or, or research it anyway, or make a smallpox medication, right? So essentially their desire to make money, their self-interest, right? Because, I mean, that's their... You can't say they're entirely greedy because they're definitely providing for the needs of people, but... They're also benefiting from it. So the way you describe it, the way Adam Smith describes it, is self-interest provides for the needs of other people, whether it helps other people out, right? So I want to make money, and I provide you with medicine. Does that help you? Yeah. It does. Does it also help me in my greed? Yes. It does, right? So self-interest provides for the needs of people. None of this stuff works exactly the way that we describe it here, and it all sounds wonderful. But like, you know, for example, for competition, most companies end up buying out the other companies or working together to screw people over. So you need government intervention sometimes. I'm not saying this is perfect. Don't walk away thinking, oh my gosh, why aren't we doing this? It's amazing. These things aren't perfect. But the fundamentals behind them are, are pretty sound. 
Um, and so again, we have the invisible knee, invisible, invisible knee, invisible hand, self-interest, or greed, if you want to say it that way, provides for society's needs. Again, if like, here, I'll use a simpler example. Let's pretend there wasn't enough water in Lakebrook. People needed water. Are they going to pay money for that? Yeah. Yes. Hell yes, they are. They, they need that to live, right? That's a need. Water, medicine, food, shelter, clothing, those are all needs. We, we need those things. So people are going to pay for them. So if you guys all desperately need water, it would be a very good idea for me as an entrepreneur, a risk taker, to go out and somehow, like, I don't know, get water here, whether it's by truckload or by diverting a river this way or whatever. I'm going to make a crap ton of money by providing you guys with water. So your needs are met, and my self-interest helped me do that. Because I might also want to help you out, but I am also going to profit heavily from this. So self-interest is going to provide for those needs, essentially. That is the core of capitalism. All right, what else do I want to say about capitalism? That's how it works. I think we covered all of it. That's the fundamentals of, of capitalism and what led the, the way for that. So, that's going to be my go-to system. So now, am I going to have the lowest prices possible for the most part? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Am I going to have people being innovative and doing what they want, yeah. creating, inventing things? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Right. So this, this sort of development across 200 years is going to leave the door wide open for this era of a whole bunch of innovations in technology and production called the Industrial, Industrial Revolution. Revolution. Exactly. So let's get to that. You guys good on capitalism? So it's like there's basically no guilt. Yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. So these two elements here are the goal is to have no government interference. Well, I can't spell. And when the government's not interfering or, or hands off, the word they use for that is laissez-faire. And that's a big key element here. The reason why they want, the reason why Smith and others want a laissez-faire is because if the government's involved, it's going to increase the cost of production with taxes or, or regulations, which makes it more expensive, which means you raise prices, which people, means people buy less, which you lay people off, and it starts the cycle going the opposite direction. Or it means they're somehow controlling what's made and how you make it, and that's going to make it less innovative, like guilds did. So that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, by having the government not be involved or be involved as little as possible, they want to try to keep costs low so there aren't, there aren't extra taxes, and they want innovation to be as free as possible without limitations. That's why he wants laissez-faire um, hands-on. I just forgot to mention that when I talked about the no guilds, no tariffs thing. We good on that? All right. We'll, we'll actually be free trade for Euro, because free trade is not even part of the world curriculum, so why bother right now? We'll do it for Euro, though. All right. So, time to talk about the Industrial Revolution. And we're counting this as a box. Good guy. Okay, Industrial Revolution. So we have two major things that are going to lead to this era. We, ch we literally just talked about them. So one is, one is an economic, a series of economic innovations that allow people to do what they want, to take risks, and get money fairly easily to invest and create factories. So you've got things like commercialization and capitalism. Capitalism. They provide two things. They provide a money supply and economic freedom <coughs> to take risks. Is it a risk to start a factory? Yes. Yeah. Is it a risk to fund exploration? Yeah. Is it a risk to buy something expensive in the hopes of creating or making a profit? Yeah. Absolutely yeah. it is, right? And that's going to be allowed here by capitalism. So commercialization and capitalism are going to allow uh, this industrial revolution to start taking place. Again, if I'm gonna start a factory or, or a business or whatever, if I have an idea for an invention, I'm gonna need investors and I'm gonna need them to be able to take the risk on me. Like if I'm like, oh, I have this great idea for this machine, I just don't, I can't buy the parts, 
I'm going to have to find a bank or a rich individual to invest in me and take that risk and do that. So I can't do that unless I have a free market capitalist system that allows people to do that. All right. I'm also going to have this whole sort of culture of innovation, a lot of new technology coming out of especially Protestant countries because of what? Scientific revolution. Yeah, the scientific revolution, right. Especially in Protestant nations. Cultivates innovation and technology. All right, and, and the uh, industrial revolution is really going to start. Really going to start here. Oh, by the way, what year does this pretty much start? It also happens to be the start of the of the modern era. 17. Yeah, roughly seventeen fifty to roughly eighteen forty or eighteen thirty. That's the first industrial revolution. All right, and, and in what country does this really start off in and take off from? Britain. Yeah, Britain, Great Britain, correct. All right, and it's Great Britain now because they've conquered Ireland, Ireland and all the islands in the British Isles. All right, so Great Britain is going to be the uh, starts Industrial Revolution. All right, so the question, of course, is why Britain? We've got these two elements are both in Britain. They're Protestant and have scientific revolution innovation going on. They've had commercialization and capitalism going on, so they've got a large money supply. What are some other reasons why Europeans, specifically Britain, are going to start this industrial revolution? They were the main textile producers. That makes them the main textile producers. You're getting a little ahead of yourself, but that's still correct. Just not, not in causing the industrial revolution. They have natural resources. Yep, they have natural resources available. Like what for the industrial revolution? Coal. Coal, Coal. and iron. Yep. Coal. Iron, lumber, plentiful. What else? Uh, water access. Yep, they got lots of rivers and water access. What do they use those rivers for initially? Trade. Transportation. For trade, transportation. transportation, also power. How do they use it for power? The, the, the mills, exactly, the mills. And again, the trade and transportation means they're going to be able to move large amounts of things, large quantities of things, up and down the rivers. Much easier than trade carrying it by horse. That's, of course, before railroads, which are way better than, well, even anything we've still created. The railroads are still technically the best way to, to carry stuff across land, better than planes anyway. Planes are quicker, but it's a lot more cheap to send a train with more stuff. Slower, but, but cheaper. But I see, of course, with these large steel ships, these tankers are huge. Mills, mills like mills. not a windmill. Like, uh, have you ever seen like it's like a river coming, and you've got like this factory or whatever right by it? It's a pretty cool drawing. Um, and so you got this river like right next to it, and what you'll have is uh, connected to this factory would be this like almost thing with like a paddle, and the water. I just got a bad drawing now, uh, but. This paddle here, as the water is uh, pushing by, it catches this paddle and spins the paddle, and that creates the power and energy, or at least moves the, the mill or whatever it is for the, for the factory. What is a dam? A dam is just when they stop the water, they cut but it off. Doesn't it also like, generate energy? It does, but we, we're not going to discover that until a little bit later, the second industrial revolution. They discover, though, basically, if you spin, how does it go? I might describe this imperfectly, but essentially, you like. If you spin a magnet around coiled wire, it, it moves the electrons through and creates electricity, essentially. So it, that might not be a perfect explanation, but that's all dams are. It's like as water's running through, it's spinning magnets around coils, moving slash creating electricity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just magnets spinning around coils. All right. Um, also, they have access to the Atlantic Ocean. Why is that? Why does that matter? Well, their discovery of the new world was was part part of the Exactly. Right, they're right on the edge. Here's another reason, but I forget it. This is good enough. Oh, of course, that's what it is. This country also has a lot of protection for private property. Why do they have a lot of protection for private property? Because they're gentry. Yeah, because they have the the gentry and the government, right? So they have private. Property 
protection. The, uh, the gentry in Parliament, the House of Commons. That's why it starts in Britain, more or less. That's all of the reasons. Wait, hold on. What does the Atlantic Ocean not like have access? Like, I know it's the New World, but like, why do they need access to the New World? Because they're right next to it. Like for, for, for China, for, for India to be like, let's establish colonies in the New World. They're going to have to go do, 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 oh, okay. do all the way over right. there. Okay. And then with that music, too. And then they're going to go uh, through the Pacific as well. So the, the, the British are just right there. They just <laughs> sail right to it. And what are they getting out of the Americas that's helping them out? Yeah, raw materials. Yeah, raw materials, exactly. So not only becoming wealthy up to cash crops and gold and silver, but... For this industrial revolution, they're going to have access to all kinds of raw materials uh, to manufacture goods with. So it's, that's a massive advantage for them. So yeah, we can even just put colonies in there. Yeah, like cotton, exactly. Even though it's going to be mostly made by the U.S., which will not be a colony, but it, it's so close, access-wise. Yep, and cotton's going to be very important. So are we, are we clear on the start here? Yeah. All right. Let's start getting into mechanization and textiles then. That is circle, okay. <clears throat> so British textiles. Before we get into how textiles made Britain the number one world power and really got the Industrial Revolution going there. Let's talk about how, how they started making textiles so much quicker and better than the country that had been doing it for a millennia. Who's been doing it for like a thousand years? Yeah. India, right? So, British number one textile producers in modern era. And there's... Two reasons for this. There, well, there's there's more than two, but there's two we haven't talked about yet. We've talked about the money supply, we've talked about the investment, we've talked about the private property production, all that stuff. They're going to come up with two different ways here <clears throat> that are going to allow them to make textiles super, super quickly. Yep, yeah, that's 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 an, a specific invention. So they're going to have inventions, but like when I'm replacing human labor with machine labor, what do we call that? Mechanization, <laughs> right? So they're going to have mechanization. So the two big mechanization, well, three big mechanization processes are going to be um, the spinning jenny and the water frame. So basically, one woman, because they're mostly women at this point, one woman on a spinning jenny or a water frame is going to make 10 to 20 times as many textiles in a day as one person by themselves. So it's going to make one person worth 10 to 20. And again, if you forgot, the spinning jetty essentially takes the cotton and spins it into thread, and the water frame is going to weave that thread on a big like, frame, essentially. It, they look weird. They're like, they're like move, pumping with their foot and moving, and it's like taking thread and automatically like weaving it, essentially. And the production at that point, like one person can produce, like I said, 10 to 20 times as much textile product as somebody who's not using a machine. So that's going to make things, it's going to, we're just going to put 10 times production, just to be, put the low estimate here. Okay, so spinning jennies and water frames are going to get incredibly cheap and quick to make lots and lots of um, textiles. Okay. Making textiles, though, is more than just uh, spinning thread and weaving it, though. I've got to like, you know, strain the cotton, then I've got to spin it, then I've got to weave it, then I've got to bleach it, and I've got to dye it. Like those, those are all a bunch of different processes that have to be done in other places. How did the British figure out to do all of those in one single place to make it much faster and much quicker? Or sorry, much faster, much cheaper. Yeah, they use factories. Yep, the factory system. And the factory system is, I shouldn't underline that. Actually, I should. I'm going to squiggly underline it. Because <laughs> it's a term and a term. These are terms in a term. So the factory system is essentially where all stages of production.
production done in one place. And that makes it much cheaper and much quicker. Because A, I can just train my own workers at a low wage to do it. And now instead of paying people to transport it to all these different stations and take all this time to have specialized people make it themselves, I'm doing it much cheaper with machines and much quicker, and I'm doing it all in one single spot. So like, I'll bring the cotton in, somebody will strain it, then they'll spin it, then they'll uh, weave it, and then they'll bleach it, and then they'll dye it, and it leaves as a finished product all from one single factory. Much quicker, much cheaper to have all those, those um, stages of production in one single spot. So that's gonna make Britain produce way more textiles at a much cheaper price, much more quickly than anybody else. So, who are you going to be buying your textiles from now? Great Britain. Great Britain. So that's what everybody starts doing. Everybody starts buying textiles from Great Britain. And by everybody, I mean literally everybody. Like most of North and South America are buying textiles from them. Uh, Asian empires and other Europeans are buying textiles from the British because they're much cheaper and usually at least higher or equal quality. So all of a sudden, the money supply in Britain does what? Increases. Yep. So what can they do with this new money they have now? Well, that's a tough question to answer. There's a lot of things they can do. They can spend it on their military. What can their military do? Gain more colonies and land, exactly. Did they do that in the 1700s? Yeah. Oh yeah, they do. You guys all know the Seven Years' War? That's when they'd like do a land grab and start grabbing Canada, India, etc. So they have more access to materials so they can, uh, with this extra money, they can increase their military and gain more raw materials. Right, they can do that. Can they also fund more people and banks to create more innovation and technology and inventions? Yep. Mm -hmm. Some more money for innovation. In fact, there's a very important machine Like a spout. Hmm. They've come up with an invention that can generate power much better and more quickly steam than any of Yeah, Watts steam engine, right. Such as this Watts steam engine. Now this is originally made to uh, pump water out of coal mines, which is a big problem. If you ever if you ever go to a mine and you're digging, the water that saturated the dirt just fills in the area that you were you were mining. So they need these pumps to pump out the water so they can actually mine down, get the coal and iron and things like that. So this Watt steam engine is initially just to pump water out, but do they eventually start using steam power to provide power to other machines? Mm -hmm. They do, like what? Like boats. Like boats, you're right. But what's the one that hits first that really transforms society? Trains. She's right, trains, railroads. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> is it gonna be cheap to pay for a whole bunch of iron and steel to be laid on these tracks that spread across the entire nation connecting these cities and does that sound like a cheap process? No, it's extremely expensive. So why do the British why are the British able to do it so much faster than everybody else? Yep, they've got the money supply, right? So this is gonna allow them to allow them to construct railroads faster. Than, well, anyone else? Germany and the United States are going to catch up and pass them eventually, but it takes them almost 100 years to do that. The British could have, well, not 100 years, it takes them like 60 years to do that. Uh, the British get a huge jump start on railroads. And how do railroads help you, Bob? Faster, cheaper, more efficient transportation, exactly. And what are you railroads used to connect, by the way? What kind of cities? Not imperial cities. <laughs> Cities. Someone said trade cities. That's, that's close. <coughs> There's now two different types of cities. We have cities called industrial cities, which are usually near mines or forests or things like that, and they're usually the ones producing stuff. There's also one that have a lot more bankers, investors, and <coughs> stock markets and things like that. Those are called financial cities. So cities like New York, London, Beijing, mm -hmm. Tokyo, those are financial cities. Uh, 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 San Francisco, LA, those are financial cities. Industrial cities are ones that are known more so for producing things. So Detroit, Liverpool, Manchester, those are like, you know, 
Mining or producing things, those are industrial cities. Oh, I was just going to ask what, what, oh, what are some examples of industrial oh, cities? Oh, yeah, actually, we've got some. And these are going to connect industrial and financial cities. And that's not just Britain, obviously, but they're the ones that start doing it initially. And again, an industrial city would be ones that produce things. So in the U.S., you've got, like, New York. Sorry, not New York, my bad. Detroit. Actually, San Francisco used to be. In fact, I just saw this this summer when I was going to San Francisco, coming from the south. If you come the south way to San Francisco, you get this huge hill, and all it says, San Francisco, the industrial city, which is laughable now, because they used to like make a bunch of stuff. Now all those factors are gone. Mm -hmm. It's a financial city, so they should change it to San Francisco, the financial city. Mm -hmm. What does it say after increased military? Uh, they increase the military, and that's going to uh, mm -hmm. allow them to take more territory and get more raw materials. So what does that say? More raw materials. Uh, more raw materials. Does <laughs> it does not say more raw materials. It does now. More mats. More mats. Oh, I just call it mats, because I mean, I'm using my gamer, my gamer abbreviations here. You don't say materials, you say mats. Ooh. I put the period there. We're saving so much time on me abbreviating and explaining the abbreviations. <laughs> all right. So Detroit, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, these are all main producing cities or coal cities. <coughs> and we've also got financial cities like New York, LA, San Francisco, London, Berlin. China. China the, yeah, China the country. This is all China. I think I read that Shanghai has 25 million people in it, just the city. That is yeah. absurd. We have like 38 million people in California. It's like almost all of California in one city. It's ridiculous. The biggest American city is New York with like 7 or 8 million or something like that. I don't even know if it's that many. So it's, it's pretty ridiculous, yeah. I've heard that like San Francisco has a bigger economy. They don't have a million? Or like San Francisco has like a bigger economy than some states in the... Oh yeah, that, that's true. Because a lot of the financial, yeah. A lot of the financial institutions are there. Same with like San Jose. Like you've got like Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and all the major tech and and YouTube. Well, that's part of Google now. All the major tech industries are all in like one area. So like that's just like I don't know how many billions, probably trillions. Well, billions for sure. Possibly trillions of dollars are just right over those mountains over there in the Bay Area. <laughs> like it's ridiculous. Almost everything everything we use for the most part is produced over there. It's ridiculous. All right, cool. So that's um, those are our cities are going to be connected here. And what else do we want to say before we, we move on here? Wait, what did I say? Detroit, Detroit, Liverpool. Oh, Detroit, Liverpool, Manchester, these are all examples of industrial cities that are producing things. Um, we'll call it right there today. Okay. Rolling? Yeah. All right, cool. So we left off on the uh, gentry class in private property protection uh, in British textiles. So, second industrial revolution. Start on that. No wait. No. Let's start on the identity of the middle working class. What are we skipping? Are we skipping something? I just checked. I just checked yours. What? Uh, middle class and working class identities. Last thing we did was like mechanization, factory system. Yeah, I, I described mechanization, and factory system, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna write to the new class identities then. So period five. What will be on for period five then? What years? 1900. Okay. So we got two new classes popping up here in the in the modern era. So we have the new well they're not necessarily new, especially in England and Netherlands, but they're more developed. So these are the new rich class that become quite powerful as far as economics and even political life go. Gentry? Yeah, the gentry. What do we call that like class, though? Middle class. Middle class, yeah. Okay. So the middle class are... <clears throat> why do we call them middle? What are they in between? Uh, the working class. Class. Yeah, nobles and the working class and peasants, right. So nobles are still, at this point in time, higher up, just because of one reason. What's the one reason they're higher up? Uh, noble birth. 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 Yeah, noble birth, right. That's the only thing that's distinguished them. In fact, but these middle class people are going to become actually more powerful than the, the nobility and aristocracy. All right, cool. So, middle class, we're looking at bankers, merchants, landowners, and now factory owners. Oops. 
So they're quite powerful. Um, so middle class, which we're looking at here. What are some qualities I have about in the working class? Like what, what do most men do, most women do, etc.? Um, most men were like the workers and they brought home money to like the stay at home wives who watched the children. Yeah, in fact that was important back then. Why was it why was it important for this middle class distinction to be uh, to have the wife stay home? Because if your wife stayed home that means she doesn't have to work so because you make enough money. Exactly. If you had if you had a male and a female working that meant you're you you didn't make enough money, you were lower class. It was a sign of it was a sign of affluence of, of success to have just the male work while the while the female stayed at home and, and raised the kids and, and taught them and the morals and all that stuff, right? So we had middle class women home, and that's of course a sign of status back then in Europe. <clears throat> all right, and who's the new who's the new working class I have here in the uh, in the cities? Wait, I just said what it was. Working class. <laughs> working class, yeah. Let's see who's this new class in the cities. Yes, the working class. And who are these uh, people? Give me some examples of what a working class person is. Factory worker. Yeah, factory. That's like the most standard one, right? Factory worker. We also still have peasants, guys. Don't forget, but we're focusing on this new class now. So, run me through what life is like for a working class person, as wonderful as it is. Long work hours. Long hours. Low pay. Low pay. Low pay. Separated from the family. Yep. Oh, and that's another big one, too. Dangerous. Factory life is different because with peasant agriculture, I still worked with my family, so like they worked with complementary tasks where, you know, the men would do this, the women would do this, the kids would do this, they all work together. Not anymore. How are they, how are they working now? Separated. Yeah, in separate buildings, areas, etc. Right? So they're separated. So separated from the family. Dangerous conditions. Dangerous conditions, right? They are not safe. These factors are not safe. They're, they go with hot and dangerous materials, sharp, you know, heavy, all those things. Family friendly, dangerous conditions. And what's outlawed, in fact, blatantly stopped by the government when they try to make things better for themselves? Oh, unions. Yeah, the unions are outlawed for quite a while. Okay, that's going to make a pretty crappy life. How did factory change society as far as, like, time goes, with, like, railroads and whatnot? <clears throat> they had to make a standardized time? Yeah, they had to standardize time, because they had railroads going from town to town. You had to be able to run on time, so we now have, like, standardized time for these classes. Uh, uh, because if you've got railroads all over across the nation, they all have to run like, oh, be here by this time, this time, so people can run these things efficiently. And before the Industrial Revolution, they did not have like this running like clock for the whole Western world and, and greater world. Because when railroads are running, you have to have them running on time all over the place. So to do that, they have to accept like one set time everybody's agreeing to. So this is where you have, uh, what is it called, GSM? Something like that, something medium time? Whatever. It's like the set the set time for the whole world. Standard median time? Whatever it's called. Anyways, the standardized time. <clears throat> and how do they pay these guys? With wages. What kind of wages? Hourly. Hourly wages, yeah. And for the first time, I have a large amount of people working at night. How are they able to work at night? Yeah, we're gonna have electricity here pretty quick, right? So we'll have actually some kerosene lighting too, like with oil, but also electricity is on time. So lighting for working at night. Uh, the average working class person, how many days a week are they working? Six. Six, Six days a week, fourteen-hour days. That's a rough life. And they're pretty much just working. That's about it. What do they live in? Tenement housing. Tenement housing, right. Usually like one room crappy cramped apartments with one or more families in it. And by the way, families were not like four or five people back then. You would have routinely, I mean you didn't have birth control, so you would routinely have like families of like six to ten kids, right? A lot of them would end up dying unfortunately, but um, you would have large families, so that was not easy to manage. Tenement houses. Okay. Those are my working class, the middle class identities that are formed. So you want to know those those, those struggles. Got that. Some more middle questions. Yeah. Oh, wait, are they working for fourteen hours? Or yep. Like... Fourteen hour shifts. So six days a week, fourteen hours for work. Like I mean, today for me, for example, is going to be 
about a 12 hour day. By the end of the day, I'm pretty tired. And they did two more hours. And they did a lot of physical labor. So and a lot of that work was just repetition of like hitting a button, moving a thing, like, oh, no thank you. Uh, that, that's a rough life, I don't know. It's no surprise that alcoholism was such a big thing back then because uh, they, they just had to escape. They had to escape, it's rough, all right. And, oh, should I jump right into that? I think I will jump right into that, yep. So, this working class, they, which one of these classes actually has some power in government? Middle class. class, right. So they're in things like Parliament, the House of Commons, uh, there's even representative assemblies in um, the Netherlands and France even, with its uh, Estates General, at least they have it. There's really no representation for the working class. And that's because, well, they're poor, but the reason why for this is going to be especially, they don't pay members of the government back then, at least not like Parliament or Congress members. So, can a working class person afford to leave their family for a few weeks and travel to the main city, stay there and listen to debates and vote on things? No, no they can't do that. So, the working class is totally left out of the, uh, of the vote. In fact, you have to own property, and most of these guys do not own property. However, in the early 19th century, we're going to have a guy, and instead of his beliefs, and his dad's beliefs, include these people in the government, and include them in politics, forming their own political parties and getting actual change made for them in the 19th century. It starts in England. Does John anybody know what I'm talking John about? John Stuart Mill. Is John Stuart Mill, yes. Cool. So John Stuart Mill and his dad. Yep, he's totalitarian. He's a totalitarian. I know. No. Um, oh, I forgot to start squaring these things. So there's the square. So whenever I, uh, whenever I square one, camera lady, uh, put the time that it's that it's recorded. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can just piece of paper or whatever. Yeah. Oh. So like when I square one, just write six twenty-three or whatever the time is. All right. So John Stuart Mill, he and his father uh, sort of developed and used this uh, belief called utilitarianism. And I lose a lot of you on this one. But we talked about it twice, so maybe I'll, I'll get you. Utilitarianism believes. That, what does it believe is the best thing for society? To make the most people happy, right. So, whatever the largest group of people is that's made happy by something, that's what's good. Can I make everybody happy? No. no, he recognizes that. So, he wants to make the most possible people happy. So, to do that, I have to have everybody in government, right? So, if my government's gonna have laws that make the most possible people happy, I need to have everybody involved in the government, at least voting. So, which What's the massive part of the population that's not involved in voting yet? The working, working class, right, because they don't have property. So, it means the greatest good is what makes the most people happy. And again, if I have 90% of my population not in the government, my laws are not going to be making most of those people happy. So I'm going to start getting that. And by the way, what is that belief called when you want, well, at least all males and then potentially everybody suffrage. voting? Suffrage. Universal suffrage. So suffrage means voting, right? But if I want all males, well, how would I say that? How would I phrase that? Universal, universal. universal. Male. male suffrage, right? If I want everybody to be universal suffrage. So, by the way, he does advocate universal. He wants, he wants women to get the vote as well, but West isn't ready for that yet, I guess. A hundred years or so for them. Okay, so he's also going to advocate universal male suffrage. And this is where, if we were in AP, AP Euro, we would talk about the Chartist movement and political parties, but we are not there yet, and it's not an AP World thing. So we'll just skip that and talk about the, give me a couple workers' parties that were started here in the 19th century that started getting changed. German British Labor Party. German, yep. Social Democratic. German Social Democratic Party, excellent. Cool. So we start having new political parties. So working class political parties. So we have the British Labor Party. And we have the <clears throat> German Social Democratic Party. I don't want to write all that, so GSD. All right. So they, they essentially, with the Chartist movement, they you know, have rallies and protests and pamphlets and petitions, and they, they get working class people, men anyway, uh, to get the vote. So they get the vote, they start these new political parties, 
And so now I have some working class people in government, in parliament, able to make laws. Give me some examples of laws that are made to either help the working class, like they passed them themselves, or some leaders that passed laws to make the working class happy so they didn't overthrow them. Um, a couple different examples. Well, Bismarck, which category would he be? The leader who gave them to, so they don't overthrow them, or the leader who was also working class that no. got so they don't overthrow them. Exactly, that's a new conservative, so for AP Euro, don't forget that. But yes, yeah, so we've got Germany in the 1880s. Bismarck is the leader, or he's not the leader, actually, the chancellor, but uh, <clears throat> the Kaiser's the leader. He's the chancellor of the Reichstag, which again is their representative assembly, their <laughs> parliament. The German Social Democratic Party puts pressure on him, and so he doesn't want to be overthrown, and he is going to give a few perks to workers in Germany in the 1880s. What are some of those perks? Um, Pensions. Pensions? Workers' Compensation Act and Insurance. Nice. Which is like retirement. Dan, what are these kind of policies called when the government's intervening to socialist, socialist policies? Yes. Excellent. What about in Britain? These are actually much earlier. This is the 1880s. That's quite a bit. We're talking like for Britain, like 1830s, 1840s. Um, the 10 Hours Act. 10 Hours Act, which of course then was the day of 10 Hours. Mines Act, which keeps kids under nine out of mines, I believe, underground mines. The Factory Act, which bans kids under 10, I think, something along those lines. So, yes, so then we have the British Labor Party is going to have the Factory Act, Mines Act, 10 Hour Act. And all these laws protect who? Working, Working class. class. And did, did a leader pass these so they didn't get overthrown? No. no. Who, who passed these? Oh, yeah, Parliament, exactly, Parliament, which largely those socialist slash labor parties, right? Cool. So we actually have some representation for this working class, and of course they're going to either put change in themselves or scare the government into changing for them. Wait, um, and those are two different approaches, the British and the years, Germans. Um, the oh, 1830s and 1840s. I can remember the exact years, but 1830s and 40s. Okay, so that's that. By the way, People really didn't like this right here. They didn't like the tenant homes, the bad hours, the banning unions, all that stuff where the working class was being oppressed, according to some people. And they were. It was pretty bad back then for workers. I have some alternatives, some alternative economic systems, because people think this is corrupt. What are some of those alternatives? Marxism. Marxism, yes, or communism. So what is Marxism, which is far left, which we've talked about before. You guys know, I think, now what far left means. Uh, what, what, how would I label this? What's the, what's the struggle here? What's the issue? Oppressors. Yeah, so this is leftist, so it's going to be oppressed versus oppressor, oppressors. And the thing here that they think people are struggling over and they have throughout history is going to be private property. Right, exactly. So we've got Karl Marx and Engels. They're going to write a book in 1848 called The Communist Manifesto. And again, these guys have been like, well, humans have been fighting for a long time. Oh, wait, wait, I'm going to I'm gonna box that for communism. She's like, oh, I'm going to wake up and do that. Um, so, Marx and Engels are going to write this book, uh, Communist Manifesto, which sets up a three-step plan. Before we do that three-step plan, uh, let's talk about who he used to think fought over, because he thought the whole, all the problems of the world could be explained by a simple solution, an ideology of oppressed versus oppressors, where they're struggling over private property. So they're fighting for this private property, whether it's landowners or factory owners or whatever. There's a historical struggle. So what do you, what do you think was the first historical struggle of civilization? Slaves. Masters and slaves. Patricians. Yep, and then the classical era, patricians versus plebeians, in Rome anyway, plebeians. Then what was it in the feudal era? Nobles versus peasants. And of course, the first name is the one that has the land and the power. No, the private property, rather. Middle class. Property. Yeah, and the new one is going to be middle class versus working class. Oh. 
So if he thought the whole issue was a struggle, a class struggle for private property, yeah, in terms of a simple solution for complex problem, you're yeah, a nut. And this guy's a nut in this case. Um, well, I guess he didn't know communism wouldn't work, but I think you can explain all the pains in the world with one simple sentence is a bit ridiculous. I mean, he explained it more than that, but that's what you could really break it down to. So, class rule for private property. And so, what do you think you had to get rid of if you wanted to have peace in the world? Private property. Private property. Okay, he has a three step plan to get rid of private property. What's his three step plan? Revolutionary phase. Yep, cool. So, I first got the revolutionary phase. So, who's rising up and beating who? Working class. The working class, which he calls the proletariat. Uh, they're going to be the ones that overthrow the government and the middle class and take the property. <coughs> so, proletariat, working class, revolt, and take the government and the means of production. So, again, it's like the factories, the land, etc. Mr. Morgan, how do you explain? It said, um, like you said, it's a plan to. Uh, a plan for communism, like how to, how to rid the world of private property and suffering. Okay, that's the revolutionary phase. Then the second phase, I mean, what phase? Socialism. Yeah, it's the socialist phase. And Marxist socialism, who's in control of the government? The state. Yeah, yeah, well, the state can control the state, yeah. The, the working class is control the state, right? So what's the state doing in this phase? Yep, so they're the ones, it's like central planned economy, essentially. They're the ones determining what's made, how much is made, who, who's being paid, all that stuff. They, they're supposed to divide it equally, which, by the way, doesn't happen. Um, what else are they trying to, supposed to be supposed to be trying to do? Spreading. Yeah, they're trying to spread these revolutions elsewhere, too. So the socialist phase, of course, where the state controls and distributes the economy. And then we're done, right? That's, so, that's socialism? State run economy? No? What's the overall goal here? No borders. Exactly, they want to end all borders. That's they're trying to spread this revolution so that when all the world becomes socialist, they will end the borders and everybody will share everything and live in a happy little commune and hug each other and no one will ever die or be sad. Right? That's how it works. And what phase is that called, by the way? Communist. Communist phase, like a world commune. I think we all agree the sentiment sounds nice, it's just, we've tried it, it doesn't work, it just kills millions of people. Like Literally, it. like I'm not even exaggerating, that's just the fact of what happens. It sounds nice, the way you describe it. It does, it does sound great on paper, but we know what happens when we actually do it. It says distributed Yeah. Slash land. <laughs> also spread revolution. <laughs> And of course, the communist phase, which we've never gotten to, is end all borders, live in communes. Like everyone's supposed to do what they're good at and what they're able to do and can do, one, and share everything. And it just goes against our biology. It's sad, but it's unfortunately true. Yes? Was Robert Owen? Oh, yeah. Robert Owen, don't forget, that's for AP Euro, where we talk about utopian socialists, and we have like Charles Fouillet, Saint Simone, and Robert Owen, right? And they're the ones that first talked about like having the state control the economy. They didn't have this elaborate plan here, so but those three guys talked about basically kind of like this before communism. Yes, correct. So they talked about something like socialism. The belief in socialism preceded came before actual communism. But that's for Euro. That's for Euro, yeah. We don't talk about utopian socialists in the world. Okay. Fortunately, world. This era is a lot of like the same stuff, so we'll just be highlighting the differences for your own. All right, um, cool. So we got, actually we've got twice, this is for the internet anyway, so we just get double. Thank goodness. Um, there's also another view that thinks that, not, as, not only is there a class struggle, but that all governments are oppressive. Anarchism. Anarchism, Anarchism right. So we have another theory here, anarchy. Yep. Or I should say anarchism. And uh, Mikhail Bakunin is the one that starts this. So don't forget, <clears throat> Bakunin is a Russian intellectual, 
and he has seen some serious imperialism in his life. Um, he has watched the Russians uh, abuse and imperialize the Polish people, the Ukrainians, etc. So he knows what oppression looks like, and it's legit. They were legitimately targeting and discriminating against Polish people. He saw this. So he admittedly wrote, wrote off all governments as being inherently oppressive and untrustworthy. So what was his solution? No Get rid of all governments, right? So he believed that governments were oppressive. Solution equals get rid of governments. You know, because no one's going to try to take your stuff or anything if there's no government to save you. All right. So, he's getting rid of governments, or he wants to get rid of governments, so what's supposed to replace it? Well, they're supposed to just, like, communes are supposed to live in these, like, local communes and... Make things they and like, share them together. They make their own stuff in their yep. communities. Local, self-dependent communes. <clears throat> and do we see uh, any anarchist action here in the... Uh, uh, the, the, black the black hand. Yeah, the black hand, right. We have other groups too, like we have an American president that's killed. Mm -hmm. Gar or McKinley. McKinley, sorry, Garfield was a little earlier. McKinley got actually assassinated by an anarchist. Oh. So, um, that's the President of the United States. So, we have the Black Hand of Serbia. is an anarchist, anti-nationalist group. They're, of course, going to assassinate the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and start World War I. And then we also have President McKinley killed by one. And they were not nice about how they wanted to do it. They want to either bomb or assassinate governments into submission and, and, and eliminate them. Did they use terrorists? Yeah, they were using terrorist tactics. Yeah, but they weren't they weren't bombing civilians though. Terrorism's like you target civilians to achieve political aims. They're they're more so targeting government officials. I mean, those are usually also citizens, but you know what I mean. They're not targeting just random citizens. They're not blowing up subways to try to prove a point. What year was Corona? I think it's eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. We usually say late nineteen. So anarchism is after communism. Yeah, easy, okay. Late 19th century is fine. Uh, local self-dependent communities, communes. Wait, what is it? Late 1800s? Mm -hmm. Late 19th century, correct. All right. So now we'll talk about the Second Industrial Revolution. The importance of railroads, financial changes, single export economies, and world trade. There's a lot of topics nice. today. Have you done this one right here? All right, so that's the problems of early industrialism, or class identity politics, how they went about changing that, and some new theories that wanted to replace it. Because I thought capitalism was, was oppressive, but it's just how humans are, unfortunately. So, second industrial revolution. Who spearheaded the second industrial revolution? Germany. And the U.S. Don't forget this is the world now. So the emphasis here is um, chemicals, like bleaches, petroleum, acids. So uh, petroleum is a much faster and more efficient source of fuel for trading ships and later automobiles and planes <clears throat> than it is coal. Uh, it's also big on um, steel, yeah. Steel and steel production because they have a new way of making stuff very quickly and cheaply for steel. That's a mere process, right? They figured out that if you could fill up these huge vats with molten pig iron and you have an opening, the oxygen coming in will actually Take away or add carbon, I forget which one, I think it's take it out, uh, to sort of purify the steel. What does this say after chemicals? Bleaches, petroleum, acids. So all these make the whole industrial process much easier. Oil is used for a bunch of things. It's used as like a lubricant for machines, as you need that. Like if you don't have oil in your engine, it'll just overheat and have too much friction and explode. So it's, uh, it's 
pretty much necessary. All right, so steel production, of course, what's going to make that much better and faster is what's called the Bessemer process. And again, they put the steel into these huge vats, melt it up, or sorry, the iron. They have openings so the air can flow in and take the, either take out or add the carbon to it, which makes for a purified steel. They've had steel for a long time, but they've never been able to make it, a lot of it for cheaply, or so they've, never been able, they've never been able to make a large amount cheaply so quickly. So fast, cheap, and large amounts. And by the way, because steel is so much more efficiently and cheaply made, what am I able, what are a couple things I'm able to make a lot of? Skyscrapers. Skyscrapers, right. Now I can make much taller buildings because those steel frames and concrete, are, they allow us to go many, many, many stories up. Railroad tracks. Railroad tracks, that's a huge one. So railroads, skyscrapers, also, I don't know if I mentioned it much, but um, bridges too. Now bridges can, they can make steel bridges much more efficiently. Like, if you just go to the Bay Area over there, like those are all steel-based bridges. Uh, those are only possible because of quick, efficient steel. So, because of this, I'm going to have mass railroads, going to have bridges, and what else did I mention? Skyscrapers. Skyscrapers, right. So, vertical cities. If you go to Europe, most of the cities are like, like you go to Dublin, Ireland, for example, there's not many skyscrapers. It looks weird. It's this huge city, but it's very flat. Because you're used to seeing a big city like the United States, LISF, New York, vertical cities. They're very high up. You've got a whole bunch of people, offices, and buildings in one small square area. So it really helps improve efficiency. Skyscrapers. Okay. And um, there's also something called interchangeable parts. And so for like guns and railroads and, and, and steam engines and cars, like you have these pieces that you make a whole bunch of and you assemble it. So if it breaks down, I lose a part, do I need a whole new car? No. no, I just go and replace the part very easily. So it makes it a very easy to build and replace process. I also have the development of electricity. They literally figured out that if you spin a magnet around copper coil, it creates electricity. And that is what's powering us right now and everything in every building in the United States is powered in some way by that. Something is spinning a magnet around uh, copper coils and we're getting electricity. So now I've got cheaper, better power, I have electric lighting, all that stuff. And with all that, of course, gonna come some new machines like the telephone and telegraph. So I have instant communication. I also attached here to petroleum. I now have the internal combustion engine. And what do we find internal combustion engines in? That's the modern engine, by the way, where like they drip petroleum in, explode it, it moves cylinders, which turn axles, which turn wheels. Cars, there you go. Cars, planes, trucks, etc. Also trains. Let me just think about it. What's quicker? Boiling water and heating it up by shoveling coal into it slowly as it burns, boils, and steams, or just dripping in oil and blowing it below up immediately? Oil. The oil is a lot quicker and more powerful. Too. All right. Um, that's good enough for the second industrial revolution. The big things are chemicals, steel, electricity, and right, let's get some uh, medicine and guns, too. So new guns. Breech loading rifle. Machine gun, early machine gun anyway. And I have some medical advances too, like how to make myself more resistant to malaria. CUNY. CUNY, yep. Where's that gonna help us out? Oh, that was not us. Where does it help Europeans out? In Africa. In Africa, right. So, I mean also, I don't wanna forget too, we also have like soap now. Why do we care about soap? What do we discover? And a second, that's what was here, right? So we discovered there's really microorganisms that make us sick, not like acts of God and being bad people and whatnot. It's really just bad hygiene. So we discovered germs, and we invent things like soap and things like that to make ourselves more clean. And is that going to save lives? 
Yeah, because yeah, people aren't just ingesting a bunch of bacteria now. They know about it, and they can prevent it somewhat. Discover bacteria, ferment soap, all that stuff. So all a bunch of crazy new stuff being developed here in the second industrial revolution. Do we understand what that one is? Yeah. All right. Of course, I forgot one thing. Though. Greater mechanization. So the scale for what I'm doing increased largely. Mass producing railroads and rail cars and skyscrapers and I beams, which are the steel beams they use for buildings. Um, that requires me to melt a lot of iron in gigantic containers and move it. And am I able to move a like a giant vat full of molten iron? Can humans move that? No. No, they can't. It would take a ridiculous amount of humans to move that. And the whole thing's too hot when they're doing it. Um, and other things like electricity and chemicals are, are deadly to humans. So I need better machinery to do that for me. So I start coming up with things that like, you know, better levers and cranks and things like that that can operate these things and uh, make it so human power isn't as necessary. So greater mechanization for a larger, modern, more dangerous processes. All right, that's the second industrial revolution. What about the assembly That's not until 1920s. So next era. Cool. All right, yep, and record. Okay, cool. So now we got railroads. Let's talk about those for a second. Everyone's favorite topic. I always find railroads so boring, but they're important, so whatever. <coughs> railroads. Who's my first main country? And they were super rich because their textile business increased their money supply and investment. Britain, yeah. So Britain, most. Uh, Germany. And the U.S. right behind, France lagging behind them, and in the very last here we've got Russia. So obviously Britain was the first one to explode with, uh, uh, with railroad production and track lane, that's what I was going for. And that's because they have the biggest money supply. All that textile business increased the money supply in Britain by quite a bit. But Germany and the U.S. are going to fall right behind with their free market economic policies and all of those things. So I have two routes. I have railroad laying by individual private organizations and businesses that do it as cheap as possible and sell these contracts to the state. And I've got state-run uh, building where they try to just pay for all this industrialization and railroads with tax money. So who tries private railroad building? U.S. U.S. Well, everyone except Russia for the most yeah. part. West. And state-run is going to be Russia. We have an example of a um, <clears throat> railroad over here in the United States that was paid for by a private company connected both sides of the U.S. Union Pacific, Union Pacific Railroad. Yep. That's here in the U.S. It connects the East and West Coast for the first time, and. There was one that connected Russia, which was massive across, all the way from the European part to the Pacific Ocean. Trans-Siberian. Trans Trans uh, yeah. That took a long time to build. More than, is it 20 years? It was more than 10 years. Union Pacific was pretty quick. <clears throat> Trans-Siberian was not. In fact, railroads were the only way that they sort of, they were the only way that revolutionized transportation. There was another way by water that made it even before railroads set in. Steamboats. Steamboats, right. What do they travel on? Canals. 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 Humans started making these large extended canals. Now, we already had those in world history. Like, the Chinese made a large one during the Sioux Dynasty. Grand the Grand Canal. But we have large-scale canal building. So, here's some examples. I've got the Erie Canal. No matter what country that's in? US. The US, right. So what happened here is, I've got the Great Lakes over here, which have a lot of lumber and raw materials, and they're trying to get to the production, the industrial and financial cities, which are on the East Coast, but it's very expensive to travel and bring those things there. So what they do is, they figure out how to navigate all these Great Lakes, and all they needed was one canal to go to the Hudson River to connect all that a lot more cheaply. So they build that, the Erie Canal, to connect the Great Lakes 
with the East Coast, so now I can have a bunch of lumber and skins and furs and coal and all that stuff coming in very cheaply. By the way, what advantage do canals have as opposed to like people bringing it by horse? Faster, cheaper, and I can carry more. The exact same benefits as a railroad, except railroads are just better versions of canals. Okay, um, I also have some canals that make the whole world a little smaller, by the way. The British start one that is going to make traveling from Asia to Europe much faster, much cheaper, much safer. The Suez Canal, where's that at? Egypt. Egypt, right? So now instead of having to go from India all the way around Africa, all the way back up here, now they can just go and cut right through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal is right here in Egypt and pop right into Europe. So it's a much, much, much quicker and cheaper trip. Excellent, so we got those. Speaking of cities, by the way, this is where Western cities like explode. I don't mean literally, I mean like population grows and uh, buildings and businesses grow. So I have two types of cities. New, large, Western cities. Gonna box this sucker. Yes. Yes. It's from Lake Erie to, to the Hudson River, I think. If it's not, it's just the river that connects to New York, which I think is Hudson. All right, so I got two types of cities. I got two types of cities. Industrial. And I have got financial cities. So industrial cities are where I find my factories. I'm there making stuff. So factory or mine based. And industrial cities are where I have things with like banks and stock markets, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, it's basically just a money city, so I would say banking and investment. So examples of industrial cities are going to be, keep in mind by the way, some of these cities have now become just industrial because like US and European production is now being done largely elsewhere in the world, but they started out as industrial cities. Manchester? Manchester, yeah. Manchester, Liverpool, those were near coal and iron mines. Uh, I had New York and San Francisco also started off as industrially based. Now those jobs have of course left to other parts of the world, now they're not financial cities, but for financial cities we can put some of the same ones. We can put like Berlin, for Germany, uh, you can put New York, SF, London, exactly. Those are all cities that have the major investment and banking centers. And what's gonna now connect these all much more faster and cheaper than ever before? Railroads, right. So that's what railroads, their primary job is, is railroads connect large industrial financial cities. So now people and goods can move quicker and more cheaply, and that's gonna make the already ahead Westerners further ahead. By the way, don't take this stuff for granted because a lot of this doesn't even exist in, most, in, a large, in a large portion of the world still. So it's uh, like literally just the fact that you can go drive to Oakdale, that's actually a big deal because you can't do that in North Korea or many countries in Latin America or Africa. But they just don't have road and railroad systems. You're just kind of on your own. So it's not ideal. All right, so those are the cities. I also have new financial strategies and in institutions. First one is going to be what's called the gold standard. And the gold standard requires your country to only have as much money available, like paper money, as your country has in gold reserves. Now, why the hell would we do that? What's that trying to prevent? Inflation, right? Because we know if you just print too much money, then too much money gets out there, all the prices raise, it becomes worthless, it causes inflation. So the gold standard did for a time limit how much money people could make. So did that help prevent some inflation or at least slow it? Yeah. It did, right, help prevent inflation. So only as much money as you have gold. We're talking about countries here to prevent inflation. So we've got places like Fort Knox, which still exists, but not for the same reason necessarily. 
those would be government forts and institutions that would hold this, this gold reserve, essentially. All right. We also have a thing called limited liability corporations. And these made it much easier for people to start businesses. So if I start a business and I make a product and it ends up, I don't know, let's say I make a, an energy drink and it's accidentally toxic, oops, and I kill a bunch of people, <laughs> am, uh, am I gonna get sued, lose my job, my life for the most part? Yeah. I am. So is it very encouraging for people to try out new products and ideas if they're afraid they'll just be sued and, and, and lose their jobs and, and, and companies? Mm -hmm. Wait, how did I ask that? What did I just ask? Oh yeah, does that promote innovation? No, it doesn't, right? You're, you're more afraid to start something new because you don't want it to go wrong and, and, and if you lose your, all the stuff you have, essentially. But here, I'll, I'll rerun it again. So if I make a bad energy drink and people start dying or getting sick from it, um, if they can just sue me directly, I will lose all of my stuff. I will lose my house and everything I own, essentially, right? But with LLCs, they make all of the, they protect people who own businesses by making the businesses and their partners responsible. So you can't be sued, they can't take your stuff, it would be dismantling the company. So you yourself would be relatively okay. Uh, that's what LLCs do. They make you as, a, as, a, as a, an owner and a worker safer from being sued directly because they'll go after your company, not your stuff. So, if I know that I'm not going to get sued my stuff taken and it would just be purely targeted to, to the business and the corporation, would I be more likely to start a company and, and do risky investment things? Yes. I would, right? That's what LLC promotes. So it protects business owners from personal targeting. So now again, I can't be sued directly. I get to keep my stuff, but they would only be able to, to sue what the company's stuff is. Uh, what does LLC mean? Limited Liability Corporation. Right. Yep. <coughs> liability is kind of like the responsibility you have as an owner, so it limits that liability your corporation has. All right, one more that I can't remember off the top of my head. Stock markets, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, what? Wait, can you read it? LLC? Uh, limited Liability Corporation. No, no, no. no protects the oh, it protects the business owner from, from being personally targeted, like their own possessions, their stuff. It keeps it focused on the company and what the company owns. That's why, by the way, a lot of the richest people in the world, their salaries are like $1. Like Bill Gates' salary, for example, is $1. Salary? Like what you get mm -hmm. why? All of his money is in his company. Oh. So what, he, so what he gets personally is just a dollar? Mm -hmm. But he can use his business money for, for anything business related, so they can write it off. It's, it's very complicated. Um, basically, if you say it's for business, and it is, you can use company money for it and not be taxed until afterwards. So it's, it's in the best interest of highly rich individuals to actually not have a salary, to keep all their money in their business so they can spend it before it's taxed. So there's a whole bunch of stuff at, attached to it. So like I said, like I'm about to start an LLC myself for my little for this stuff. Um, so it's a it's a, it's a good thing for business owners to have. What does that mean? Limited Liability Corporation. From personal. Personal targeting. So like. I'm targeting. Yep. <coughs> so if you don't make it, it's not in your name. You're not liable for it. All right. It's nice and full. All right. Lastly, stock market. This is a speculation buying, of course, which is risky buying. You're just hoping things become more valuable. And in case you forgot how it works, if a company enters the stock market, they sell little pieces of themselves to people. And if, if their company does well, or a lot of people want those stocks, the price of those things will rise. And you can make a lot of money by paying for a stock in Google 15 years ago. Now you'd be a, bull, a billionaire, because their stock was probably worth, I don't know, a few dollars, and now it's worth like almost a thousand dollars a piece. So if you went and bought ten thousand shares at two dollars, right? Put in like twenty thousand dollars, you'd be making millions, if not billions, of dollars by now, just based on stocks. This is dangerous, though. 
buying a, a stock in a company can go wrong. If nobody wants it, the price goes down, you lost money. If uh, something terrible happens to the company, they do poorly, management sucks, whatever, your stock loses value, you lose money. So it's, it's a good way to make money, but it's risky. Would that kind of be like gambling? It is like gambling. It is. You're kind of making educated get guesses, you know, based on like, you know, the history of a company and, you know, various times of the year and knowing about management moves and all these different things, but it is definitely risky because you can just, it can go all wrong. I mean, that's what largely led to the Great Depression is speculation by the United States. People got loans to do this and it inflated the prices up and nobody bought anything because it was too expensive and then the whole system sort of crashed underneath it, so it, it can happen. In fact, the... Austrian stock market crash caused the panic of 1873, which we talked about in Euro. Um, so these stock markets can be very beneficial, but also very damaging. So speculation buying, which allows for people to get wealthy. Wealth accumulation. All right, I highly doubt you get any questions on those, but that's the basics of what those things are. So financial institutions or innovations in period five would be, of course, the gold standards limit inflation, LLCs to protect business owners from being sued, and um, the stock market to allow people to become potentially very rich or very poor very quickly. Are right, you good about that? Are you good on that? All right. So we're gonna go about 15 ish more minutes and we'll take our break. I want to get through everything until we get to imperialism, so we just knock out imperialism in the second half here. If possible, we'll see. So we got single export economies and world trade. That should get us through the break. Then we do enlightenment and imperialism. And we're pretty good in the so we'll, we should roll through that pretty quickly. All right. World trade. So who was the number one producer of manufactured goods and textiles before period five? India. Yeah. So India and China. China no longer yeah. largest manufacturers. Who's now making the most textiles, steel, etc.? The West. We'll just say the West. You're right. The British do pass them, but the West is now West now manufacturing manufacturing kings whatever the manufacturing gods okay so all of world trade is going to increase substantially so we're going to see a massive increase in world trade given what i told you about new technologies tell me why world trade might increase Railroads, they make everything much faster, much cheaper, and you can move more of it. What else allows for uh, world trade to increase? Because we can't move everything by, by land, like it's not all connected. Canals. What? Canals. Canals, that's true too. Ships. I'm talking about going across oceans here. Ships. What kind of ships? Oh. Steel. steel, steamships, right. So steel ships and steamships. So world trade's up mostly because of railroads, and of course steel ships. And yes, those are powered by both steam and by petroleum later on. So why would a why would a petroleum or coal powered steam steel ship be better than a wooden sail ship? It is faster. Can I hold more in a petroleum powered steel ship? Yeah. Yes. Way more. Right. Is uh, a steel ship going to be more resistant to yes. weather and, and attacks by other people and things? <laughs> yes. Definitely. Right. So those are all going to make world trade faster, cheaper, more efficient. Faster, cheaper, and, and moving more. And do I only move goods here? People. I move people too. Move people faster and cheaper. Okay. So that's gonna this is gonna come up again later when we talk about immigration at the end of uh, period five here. So keep that in mind. What should we talk about? No, we'll talk about that. We're talking about migration, so that, that works. Okay, so that's some things for world trade. Now, here's the problem for the rest of the world is the West is getting richer and richer, uh, but they now want more access to raw materials and they want to sell their stuff to more people, not just other Europeans. So, what do I mean by new 
desires or motivations here for Europeans to imperialize the world later? What are they looking to get? Raw materials and new markets. So again, they want access to cheap raw materials and they also want um, uh, to sell things to people, so new markets. So that's gonna cause a Western desire for new markets and raw materials. Wait a second, I thought they had, <clears throat> I thought they had colonies in the Americas to get this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep, Latin American revolutions occur, so the Europeans start losing these colonies. There she is. Latin Americans start getting these colonies. Uh, so, they have to get them elsewhere. So, they, where do they look for raw materials? Africa. Largely in Africa. Where do they look for new markets? China. Largely in, yes, yeah, China and Asia, right? Right, those are both of those places. Okay. So, they go to do that, but they still do squeeze out some imperialism over here in Latin America. Now, they're not going to own colonies, but they're going to find another way to exploit these uh, Latin American companies. Single yeah, single export economy. So we'll talk about what a single export economy is, and then when we talk about imperialism, we'll talk about how we use economic imperialism and, and international or transcontinental companies like United Fruit to, to get very cheap goods and things like that. So, first of all, single export economies. So with the exception of the United States, and Canada's still a colony, by the way. So with the exception of the United States, is any American country, which has now just received independence, are any of them highly industrialized or capitalist economies yet? No, they're not. They're largely based on the plantations and mines that were there. So how do they make money? Do they, do they make money through manufacturing goods? No, how do they make money? Selling one specific yeah, they're selling raw materials, and the ones that are in high demand are the ones that they make the best. So this is where we start seeing mostly Latin American countries turn into become single export economies. Now, are these going to be as profitable and encourage economic growth like manufacturing industrial cities and industrial uh, countries? No. No, it's gonna make way less. Uh, but it does still make some people rich, the plantation and hacienda owners. Not much else though. So what are some examples of these exports that Europeans are either buying to use or buying to manufacture goods with? So give me some like countries and what they're exporting to, to Europeans in the United States. Brazil, what are they exporting? Cacao. Was it cacao? Yep. Yeah. Coffee as well. In fact, I'll give you a bunch of countries here. We got Peru. We got Mexico. We've got uh, Argentina. We've got, uh, I know there's at least one more. Mexico? I got Mexico. Going to the map in my head. I got that. Colombia? Brazil. <laughs> I think it was just the Caribbean. I don't know the Caribbean, even though it's not a country, it's a region. Yeah, Jamaica's in the Caribbean. So the Caribbean's not a country, it's a region, but uh, it's a very common product coming out of the Caribbean. So these are economies, which again are based on a very small amount of people um, growing or mining things and then selling it to Europeans. So I do not have a lot of economic growth because I don't have financial institutions like banks or stock markets. I don't have factories, I don't have manufactured goods. I don't have a wealthy lower class over here. It's just a bunch of like very poorly paid workers. So these Latin American countries and Caribbean countries become very dependent on making, growing, or, or mining certain things. Now, it doesn't mean they only had one thing per country, but this was their largest by far. So out of Brazil, I have a lot of uh, cacao and coffee being made. What is being made and produced, a, or at least harvested in Peru? What? Guano. Guano. Back crap. Isn't that energy drinks? Yes. Enjoy your Red Bull. All right. So, Mexico. Out of Mexico comes a lot of uh, metals like copper. Copper's a big one. We just put copper. It's fine. What's copper used for? What's it so necessary for? 
pennies. For pennies. <laughs> <laughs> My God, what were you about those? <laughs> you can mix it with tin to make bronze, but that's that's an old. What do we use copper wires for? Electrical. Anything electrical? Yes, exactly right. That's used for wires. Um, Argentina is going to be mostly, yeah, largely for, for beef. And the Caribbean is going to be big on sugar and or tobacco, mostly sugar. I'll put both of them. Yeah. <laughs> so the problem here is going to be with these single export economies, who's really benefiting from this? Uh, You're right, the Westerners, the Europeans are definitely, the US and Europe is definitely benefiting from this. And then who in the country is benefiting? Are the, are the workers benefiting? No. no, there's not a lot of economic growth, right? It's really just one class of owners getting the bulk of the business here. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not, at least in the West, if companies and people are making a lot of money, a lot's going to taxes, which enhances infrastructure, which helps everybody out. Not a lot of that's going on over here. There's a lot of corruption with taxes and things like that. And the reason why there's corruption with taxes, like large companies not paying many, uh, workers' wages being kept low, is because of a certain particular reason. Why is it being kept so low? Or why are there so few taxes, so little infrastructure, and so low of wages? Public yeah, they're public governments, right. We'll get into that here in a second. So let me write down. Benefits West and, uh, not factory and plantation mine owners. And again, we still have this with manufacturing countries, right? We still have, of course, the middle class, the working class, but when these companies make a lot of money, that's gonna increase the tax money, which goes into infrastructure and military, which benefits everybody, essentially. Not, not perfectly, but it's something. There's almost no benefit here going on to the lower classes in Latin America. And there's a reason for that. And I'll just talk about it now before the break. The reason here is going to be what's called economic imperialism. Now, this is different from regular imperialism, where Europeans are running the government. That's not the case here. We actually have Latin American people, like actual Argentinians, actual Mexicans, actual Chileans and Peruvians. All these guys are running the government, but they're getting money from somebody or something to keep their power. Okay. Yes. So I have what are called transcontinental businesses, which means businesses that stretch across multiple continents. And almost all these companies, in fact, all these companies come from one type of people, and those are Westerners. So you've got companies from the United States and companies from Western Europe. I forgot Britain. I forgot forget Britain. They're so important. Uh, all these companies are based either in Europe or the United States, but they operate here throughout the world, wherever there's imperialism, essentially. That's a transcontinental business. So that's a Western business operating in other continents. I gave you two examples. You guys remember them? United Fruit. United Fruit, which is the most important one that we're going to talk about. And Hong Kong, Hong, Kong. Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, right? United Fruit is good enough for you to know. I just want you to know who Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation was. That's a British company, British bank. They call themselves the, the world's local bank. It's actually kind of a clever slogan, I'm not going to lie. But not good for the people over there. All right, United Fruit. So, again, Money from these companies is largely not going to taxes, and the people who are trying to make money from this, they're keeping their wages very, very low. Now, why is that happening? Why are they having very little money going into taxes, infrastructure, and why are they keeping wages very low in these governments? Yeah, these are what we call puppet governments. So they establish puppet governments. So governments that are being controlled or manipulated by somebody else, in this case, a company. So what they would do is they would supply Latin American leaders with money and supplies to maintain political power. So what would happen would be, obviously the people of these countries don't like this, 
But if they try to fight, fight back, who's giving the governments of these countries all their money and weapons? Yeah, the fruit companies are supplying them with that. And in fact, even if that fails, the United States, for example, they're going to invade on behalf of our companies and the, and, the, and the land we have there and undo any sort of revolutions or trouble. We literally invade the, the, the Latin American countries and Caribbean countries like 40 times in like the 1920s and 1930s. Like, I think I gave you guys like a little chart once that showed all the invasions we did mm -hmm. in Caribbean and Latin America in the 1920s and 1930s. So if any of these governments were threatened, these, uh, these fruit companies would provide them with money and weapons to, to fight back on their own, or the U.S. Marines would go in and, and stop any sort of revolution that was forming. And of course, why would a company shell out millions of dollars to supply them with, with guns and weapons and money? So they can keep their companies there? Why do they want their companies there? Because it's more popular. Yeah, so they had these governments required puppet governments give Western companies best land, low taxes or no taxes, and low wages so these companies could profit the most. So either the United States government or these companies provided support to these governments to stay in power, be it marines or supplies or money. And in exchange, these American companies got huge discounts on land and taxes. They got the best land, and these governments kept workers' wages low so these companies could maximize their profits. Why is that imperialism? Yeah, are the, are the native people in control of their government? No. Not really, right? It might be a native person, but they're being manipulated or exploited by a Western, Western power. And that, that's imperialism. When Western powers are controlling or manipulating another country for their benefit, and that's what's happening here. So in the other cases for imperialism in Africa, Oceania, and Asia, you have direct European and American governments and militaries controlling other countries. This is where you don't have that, uh, but you do have American companies either supported by the US military or supporting governments uh, to, to keep these prices and taxes low. So that's one of the harder things to grasp from this era. Do, do you guys understand that? Yes. So if you had to write a short answer about economic imperialism, you'd be able to give something about United Fruits or transcontinental businesses or public governments yeah. and single export economies. All right. Any questions about that? Break.